Man, open your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter number 11. Judges, chapter 11. And as you find that, if you are able, please stand in honor of God's word. We'll read the first 10 verses. I'll read the odd verses. You read the even, if you will. And we'll finish together. And uh, the... Uh, or I'll finish in verse 10, and then I'm going to jump to another few verses and read those uh, to you. So the title of the message, by the way, is It's Not My Fault. And uh, did you ever say that? Did you ever hear anybody say that? Yeah, well, we're going to straighten that out tonight. All right, so verse 1. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead began, uh, begot Jephthah. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are you come unto me now when you are in distress? And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the, the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? Now drop down to verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead, and Manasseh and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow and said unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt uh, without fail deliver me, uh, the children of Ammon, into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon. Amen shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask your blessing tonight uh, upon your word as it goes forth as we consider uh, some things. It's not my fault, uh, but we have to face reality. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with you and realize that that's just an excuse, and we cannot use excuses and be what you want us to be. So we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We live in a excuse-prone society. Everybody's got a reason that something happened. Criminals are excused from crimes because Society supposedly failed them and did an injustice to them. High-ranking government officials uh, are excused from their actions because 
of their positions. Crooks and thieves are excused from paying honest debts due to lenient bankruptcy laws. Unfortunately, that attitude is not only used by the world, it's becoming more prevalent among God's people. Many excuse, for example, their disobedience uh, to the Lord and have excuses for that. For example, uh, I can't tithe, I can't afford it. it. Might be an excuse that I hear from time to time. Others excuse their failure to read the Bible and to study God's word by saying they just don't have the time. It's sad to say, but many Christians are just giving up and quitting too easily. All of us have problems. I don't think we can go through life without having some problems and some difficulties, but they do not excuse us from living godly lives and obeying God's word. But overcoming problems is a daily task, isn't it? Something, uh, we'll, we'll deal with the problem today and next week we'll have a new one. They just seem to know where our doorstep is. But we need to learn to deal with them. We need to learn to become problem solvers and not use our problems as excuses. So let's look at a few excuses tonight. One excuse that uh, uh, is often used is a bad childhood. You just don't know what it was like in my home. You don't know what my parents were like. You don't know what the society was like that I lived in. Well, let's consider some of the possibilities here. Parents divorce and children must deal with all that is involved. And many times they don't even consider uh, what the children are gonna face as a result. Parents are unsaved and involved in all sorts of sinful activities. Child abuse, you hear more about it at least today. It takes place whether physical, mental, or emotional, it's there. Homes where alcoholism and drug use uh, creates a constant turmoil in the lives of children. These are all terrible situations. And I'm sure if I ask, you could come up with a lot more. But let's just stop with that for a moment. Let's consider the inconsistencies. One Christian from a less desirable background uses it to excuse their own sinful behavior. But another from a nearly identical background uses it to, as a motivation to serve God and minister to others. So the background in those two cases didn't make any difference other than what they used it for. When they took the problem and made an excuse, they ran from doing the right thing. But when they took the problem and used it as a motivation to go a different direction, then God blessed their life and used it. The difference, one chooses to use it as an excuse and another to deal with their problem and use it for God's glory. So we have a biblical example of this in the text that we read. Here was a, a, a home that was kind of a mess. Jephthah had a difficult childhood. Think about it for a moment. His mother was a harlot, a prostitute. That would be a terrible thing for a child to grow up with. And uh, the society around him knew that it was so. And they talked about it. So he was disowned and disherited by his family because of that in verse 2. And he was run out. Now Jephthah could have done what a lot of people do. He could have sit around and complained, felt sorry for himself, and thought, what's the use of trying? But we read in verse 29 
that the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and God greatly used him. So the, his background didn't make a lot of difference. As a matter of fact, when you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32, you find that he's listed in God's hall of fame, the great faith chapter. And so here's a man that had every reason, humanly speaking, to do nothing. But he did the right thing. Now think about this for a moment. You can do the right thing. You can be the right kind of person. And not everybody's going to appreciate it. Look at what happened to him. It wasn't his fault what his parents were. But he was run out. They said of him, if you go back to uh, verse 2, uh, it said, And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So they got rid of him. They did not want him. But they knew some things about him. And so now the situation comes that they're being attacked. War is coming. You know, Sometimes the world will make fun of us. Sometimes people will put us out and push us to the side. But when trouble comes, they remember who walked with God. They remember. And so they sent word to Jephthah and said, uh, we want you to come back and lead us. What a change of heart. They didn't want him in their presence, and now they want him for a leader. But what they recognized was here's a man in whom God could use. And if we're going to have a war, we want God on our side. So we'll call for him and ask him to come back and lead in the battle. And he comes back. And we didn't read on, but if you read the rest of the chapter where we left off, you'll find out he has a great victory because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Now, that's one reason that people make excuses for not doing what God wants them to do. I'm glad that we've got a theme this year uh, of serving the Lord with gladness. And I've tried to give you uh, in the last few weeks some people that have been serving the Lord with gladness. Because I think we all can. And I think we all should. But the reality is too many excuses out there. People find a reason not to. You don't understand my situation, preacher. Probably not. Well, another excuse that we make sometimes is past failures. There are many used-to-be's who use their past failures as an excuse why they're not serving God now. That's a shame. You see, Sin is definitely destructive in the life of a Christian. And many of these folks have started out and they've gotten into sin and then they just think God can't use them. But we understand that God has a remedy for a Christian who sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The reality is the same blood that saves us washes away those sins also. So there is no excuse there except we look at that. And some people will start out and, and, and fall on their face in sin, but confession and repentance will bring God's forgiveness. Throughout the scripture, we find that uh, a, our life as a believer is compared to a walk. And there'll be times when in that walk where we stumble and maybe fall flat on our face, but we cannot use that for an excuse to quit. Be careful. 
David comes to mind when we think of a person like that uh, about personal failure. After his moral downfall, he could have given up. He could have said, how can God ever use me again? There's no hope because of what I've done. But instead, he repented before God and found that God's grace was sufficient, bringing healing to his broken heart and that he could serve God again. Sometimes the failure, though, is not a failure of sin. Sometimes we have to, have to deal with the fact that we've tried to do something and we just couldn't quite get the job done. Now, maybe it was something that we did and didn't realize it. Maybe we started a task that, that, uh, uh, and had unrealistic ideas of what would take place. But I've met many people like that. I tried this once. And I'm not going to try it again. Uh, I, I'm just not going to be embarrassed again because I failed in the first time. But you see, past failure is not an excuse. Life is not over after failure. And we must always remember that. Henry Ford said this, that uh, failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. And that's a good thought. Failure is an opportunity to begin again, but you've learned some things. So it's, you have a little bit more understanding of how to do things. Thomas Edison said, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And of course, you know that he had about a thousand failures before he invented the light bulb. But he kept on and finally uh, uh, was able to uh, produce the light bulb. So failure in itself is not an end to our service to God because here's the fact, and we need to be learning this. God is long-suffering. He's not like us. He is long-suffering to us, Lord, and is willing to forgive and willing to use. Now, so, some of us, we sit back and and we'll watch the news and we'll see what this criminal did and, and uh, uh, we'll be like, well, we just need to blow their heads off. That'll take care of them. Well, that's a fast way to do it, that's for sure, but uh, uh, not very long-suffering. Yes, criminals ought to be convicted and they ought to deal with their sin. I'm not saying that. They're not. But I'm just saying we ought to hear the facts before we make judgment. We ought to understand what's taking place. But, uh, and then when there's an opportunity to forgive, we should forgive. And we should forgive whether the person wants forgiveness or not. Now that's a hard one for some of us. But if God is long suffering to us, we should be long suffering and forgiving to others. I've used the uh, illustration before. I'll do it very quickly. Years and years ago, someone really did some harm to me personally in the ministry. And uh, if you know me well, you know I, I'm, I just don't retaliate. I believe God can take care of it. And so I forgave that person. Ten years later, they came to me and said, I did this and I was wrong. I want you to forgive me. And I said, well, you're already forgiven. I did that 10 years ago. I didn't want to mess with it all the time. My point is, I could have let that bother me and it affected my ministry. Or I can be forgiving whether they deserved it or not and be forgiving. We should all be willing to forgive. So what do we need to do? If we're struggling with this idea that I've got an excuse for what I'm doing or I've got an excuse for what I'm not doing, then we need to make some changes. 
the first one is the obvious one. Stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. Instead of why we can't, let's stop and think why we can. Why I shouldn't, instead, why should I? You see, we should be looking at things differently. We can use the situation to draw us down or to move us in the right direction and build us up. So we need to accept our circumstances. I can't change who my parents were. I personally wouldn't want to change who my parents were, but I've seen, met some folks that if I was in their position, I would think I'd like to change who my parents are because of the background. But you can't change that. So you have to accept your circumstances and accept the position that you're in. Instead of making excuses for actions, we need to find a reason to change our behavior, to change our thinking, to change our attitude. So we stop making excuses. The second thing we need to do is start calling sin by name and confess it before God. Sin is still sin. Now, <laughs> we live in a generation who doesn't like that word. It's a mistake. It's a problem. No, it's sin. Why not just say it's what it is? So, you know, and we make excuses for people. For example, uh, alcoholics are no longer drunkards. They have a disease. Homosexuals are a, a lifestyle, not a sin. And you go on and on with that. We make all kinds of excuses so people do not have to get right. But in your life, you can't change all of society. I understand that. But in your life, you can recognize sin, call it sin, and confess it before God and ask him to forgive you. Instead of complaining about debt, for example, let's confess that we've been poor stewards and often guilty of covetousness. And that's the reason we got into the debt problem to begin with. Let's recognize what happened. Confess the sin of anger instead of saying the way we like to say it, well, I shouldn't have yelled. Well, that may be true, but confess it as sin. You see, we like to soften what we do. That's making an excuse for our behavior. Rather than saying, I don't have time, why don't we just admit before God that we're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God? It's really what it boils down to, isn't it? And so we can come to this place where we recognize something and make changes. And so then we just apply God's answer to sin and that's confess, repent, and receive God's forgiveness. Third thing we need to do is forget about our past and build toward the future. Do you ever have anything in your past you wish you could do over? All of us do, I suspect. But you know what? You can't. There's no way you can go back. The past is past. History is history. Good or bad, it's gone by. So we need to learn to forget about that and build toward the future. Determine in doing that to quit having pity parties. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Well, so-and-so doesn't like me, so that really bothers me. 
you ought to be a preacher. You'll find a lot of so-and-sos that don't like you along the way. But I, uh, every preacher has to make up his mind that I'm going to do what's right. It doesn't matter if Mayor Snyder doesn't like it. It doesn't matter if I get a few hate letters from people who don't even understand what I'm doing. And I'm talking, not talking about church members. I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever had a hate letter from a church member. I know some preachers that have, but I haven't. I'm thankful for that. But I've got a lot of them from the community when I took stands that they didn't like. That's all right. I'm not going to sit around and have a pity party because I got better things to do. I can use my time in a productive way. Why should I let somebody else pull me down? You see, when I have a pity party, what's happening to me then? Well, let's just look down here. How about Peter? Can you stand up? Now, Peter would never do this. Right? You would not do it. You'd, I was going to say he would never go out and win souls, and he agreed. You never agree to anything. Do you know what they're going to say? Learn that lesson real quick. But let's just say for an example that Peter, oh, let's see, what did he do? He went to Mr. King and he told a lie on me. That's a terrible thing. He shouldn't have done that. He created a problem. So what can I do? I can have a pity party, but I can't change it. What, what should I do about that? Should I try to get even? What do you think? No. Okay. Should I forgive you? You're forgiven, sit down. <laughs> My point here is, I can't change what has taken place. Really can't change that. Nothing can change the past. So I need to put an end to the pity party and be responsible for my present and for the future. Since I can't change the past, why deal with the past? But I can do something about today. I have this moment that I'm living in and I can be what God wants me to be today and I can make plans and work toward having a better future. But I can't have a pity party about the past because it's not going to change it. How many have ever had a pity party? Come on now. Well, all right. Thank you. I knew I wasn't the only one here. But let me ask you, did it change anything? Did it make you feel better? It does just the opposite, doesn't it? So forget about it. I can't change it, but I can live for tomorrow. I can live for the present where God wants me to be, and I can serve him in the future. So it, we come to a place then, it's time for us to move forward for the Lord. Then the fourth thing is, we have to remember that God can change us. It's sinful and a mark of immaturity to those, I, I know I'm going to slap somebody right in the face right now. Just say ouch and go on. But it's sinful and an act of, a mark of immaturity to say that's just the way I am. But I thought when 
person got saved. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I guess Jesus failed. Or did we fail Jesus in that? You see, we serve a great God. And if I know that I have a problem, I can go to him. I know that he can change me. I know that he can even make the circumstances. He may not change my circumstances, but he can change the way I handle those circumstances. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says this. Many of you are going to know that, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, I can recognize that I have limitations. I can recognize that I can't do some things on my own. But I can also recognize that my limitations are God's opportunities. That he can do something with me. He chooses the weak to confound the wise, the Bible says. If you think you're weak, he's looking for you. He's got a job for you. He uses uh, the, the things that are not important in this world in their sight to handle those who think they are important. It's amazing what God can do when we let him. These are God's opportunities to show himself powerful and mighty in our lives. So we need to do what God has tells us to do and let him take care of it. James 1 and verse 22 says to us, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. In other words, get busy. Let God take care of the situation. So we need to quit making excuses why I can't. I said one time, I've heard all the excuses. I think I've heard every one. And the next week, somebody came up with a new one. So I guess I've never heard them all. But it doesn't matter. Excuse is still an excuse. And it's not acceptable. We need to quit making excuses why we cannot serve God and start serving him with all of our might. We need to start serving the Lord with gladness as he works in our life. And then we need to determine to become problem solvers, not excuse makers. Anyone ever had an excuse? It's poor Japheth. Everything went wrong. Born in a bad family. His brothers, half-brothers kicked him out. And yet, God used him in a mighty way. I don't know what your excuse is, but it's probably no worse than his. And God used him. So whatever your excuse is, right down there is a place to put it and walk out with the burden lifted doing what God wants you to do. Let's stand for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment, what's your excuse? The fact is, all of us can find excuses. But instead of saying, what's my excuse? Why don't we say, this has given me an opportunity to let God work in my life. To let God do something with my life. Why not put it on the altar? And then just go out and let God take care of it. You can do that. God wants you to do that. And God wants to work through your life so you can serve him with gladness. 
Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would bless tonight as we take just a moment to search our own hearts, uh, that your will would be done in our lives. We know, humanly speaking, there are reasons why we can't. But you're a great God. Human excuses do not work because you're all powerful. Help us to lay those things on the altar and go forth from this building and serve you with gladness. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 380 in your hymn book, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. As we sing that together, God speaks to your heart. Here's a place to pray. Others have come and gone. What about you? As God speaks to you. Continue singing, won't you come? Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Be in prayer for Wednesday service as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. And uh, uh, appreciate that. Uh, keep Tanya on your prayer list. She has made it to Kansas City, so she's there with her mother. And we're thankful that she had a safe journey. Pray for her and her mother both, if you would, please. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Uh, John Paul, would you dismiss us, please?